Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 87. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? I am Jay Scott, your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, here once again this week with my lovely co-host and wife, Mrs. Carol Scott. How are you doing today, Carol? Doing so well, thank you. And speaking of thank you, thank you to all of you amazing listeners who are out there doing good for others right now. That is truly one of my very, very favorite things about this time of year. So many of us as entrepreneurs, as small business owners are so dedicated and committed to giving back even more than we get and realizing this year has been really tricky on people. So we really appreciate all of you who are out there giving, doing it, not necessarily to get fanfare and throw it all over social media, not to get recognition, but simply doing it, doing good because it's the right thing to do. So thank you to all of you. Absolutely. I could not have said it better myself. Um, so I'm just going to jump into this episode because, yeah, that was, that was a great message um, and I can't say it any better. Um Okay, let's talk about this episode because I'm really excited about this episode. Um, I've been asked a whole bunch over the last couple of months about franchises. So many people that I'm talking to want to start franchises. I don't know if something's changed or I'm just talking to different people or for some reason 2020 is getting people excited about jumping into new businesses and people are thinking about franchises. Uh, so I, I kind of went out there and I said, who can I find that can tell our listeners all about franchising? And so I found a guy named John Austinson. He is the CEO of a company called Fran Bridge Consulting. And John is amazing. He is an expert on franchising. Um, John is a self-described, he's a matchmaker. That's how he describes himself. Basically, his job is to help franchisors, the companies that create these big franchises, and franchisees, the people like you and me that want to buy franchises, he helps put them together. So he helps people like you and me figure out the right match if we're looking to get into a franchise. So what matches our interests, what matches our expertise, what matches our strengths and our cash position and our goals. And basically he serves as a consultant uh, to help get us into the perfect franchise. And on this episode, we discuss everything that we need to know about picking a franchise. Uh, and we start with, well, the obvious. A lot of us, when we think about franchise, franchises, we think about food and fast food, McDonald's and Subway. But John walks us through why going into a kind of a food or a fast food franchise isn't necessarily going to be the right fit for a lot of us, especially those of us who are real estate investors and have strengths and interests that lie in other places. And John walks us through how food and fast food is one type of franchise, but there are actually four different quadrants of franchises and how the other three quadrants might be better for us. Um, and then we jump into the question we all want to know the answer to. How much money can we make if we buy a franchise? How big are the margins? How much profit can we generate? Um, and from there, we talk about the other big thing that a lot of us want to know. Can you operate a franchise passively? I know a lot of us are really interested into buying into businesses that we can operate passively and we can do as kind of a side hustle. Can we do that with a franchise? And so John is brutally honest with us about whether franchises can be operated passively or not. How do we scale uh, uh franchises? Can we buy two or three or five or 10 of them? And how do we do that? Where does the money come from for franchising? If we want to start a franchise outside of our area, something a thousand miles away, can we take over a franchise far from home? Finally, we talk about distressed franchises. Is now the right time to be buying a franchise where the owner is looking to retire or the owner, the business just isn't doing well. And potentially we come in, we buy it at, at a discount and we turn it around and turn it into to a cash cow. So we talk about everything related to franchising. It's just an amazing episode. Um, if you want to learn more about John, if you want to learn more about Franbridge Consulting and, and what John does, if you want to learn about anything we discussed in this episode, please check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash bizshow87. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash bizshow87. Okay, without any further ado, let's welcome John Austinson to the show. 
John, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. We are so looking forward to chatting with you today. So many of our audience members are so very interested in franchising and learning more about that and opportunities for them. So thank you so much in advance for sharing all of your expertise and knowledge with us. Absolutely excited to be here, Carol. Appreciate you guys having me. I love the show and uh, look forward to our discussion. John, you are a franchising expert. You're a franchise consultant and you do a whole bunch of things that we're going to dig into on this episode. Uh, But let's start with your backstory. So how did you get into the franchising world? Um, How did you become an expert? What, what What did you do to get to where you are today? Absolutely. And I feel very blessed that I kind of stumbled upon it. Uh, So my background, uh, based here in Atlanta, Georgia, and after the University of Georgia, I went into consulting with Accenture, had a great international experience that parlayed into some other corporate opportunities that really provided a great run. Uh, But like so many, I had that itch to get out of that Fortune 1000 world. And, and, um, you know, for me, I wanted to go with a smaller private company, looked at a lot of different opportunities ended up with Shelf Genie, which is a large uh, national, really international uh, franchise system based here in Atlanta, uh, custom pull-out shelving for your kitchen and pantry. And I came in on the corporate side. So I had the opportunity to come in as president, run all the day-to-day operations. And uh, really during that experience, fell in love with franchising. I found that it was such a better path to business ownership for so many uh, would-be entrepreneurs out there. And those that had an interest in, in that financial freedom and that day-to-day freedom, Um, And what I also found was a lot of people think of franchising as Subway and McDonald's and fast food. And there exists this whole entire world out there that, frankly, a lot of people don't know exist and they don't understand uh, the dynamics behind it. Uh, So since then, I partnered with the founder of Shelf Genie. We have spun off as our own entity, brought in another partner. We ourselves are franchisees now. So we went from being a franchisor to a franchisee. Uh, we're franchisees across 14 different territories, three different brands uh, here in Atlanta, all in the home services, property services space. In addition to that, I spend about 75% of my time on a daily basis on the consulting side. So I represent about 300 franchise brands out of the universe of 4,000 brands. Um, so for someone that's looking to get into franchising, it can be a little intimidating, a little overwhelming to know where to start, who are the good ones, who are the bad ones. Everyone's putting their best foot forward. What we've done on the back end is we have vetted these brands. We've landed on 300 that we feel really good about uh, to put in front of our clients. And so I get to play matchmaker, if you will, uh, You know, working uh, with my clients uh, in a totally free service with them. Uh, you know, I get paid by the franchisors on the back end and, and really just have a blast. You know, Taking people through the education process, we have a very streamlined way of going about it and eventually playing matchmaker, bringing them opportunities that could be a good fit for them for consideration. So I know we'll dig more into that, but uh, that, that's what I do on a daily basis. And uh, that's a little bit about my background. Great. So, John, you clearly have a wealth of experience. And like you've said, you've vetted all these different available franchises down into about 300. That seemed to be the the best match for people, if you will. So would you please talk to us a little bit more? Why should we consider franchising um, versus starting a whole new business from scratch? Absolutely. No, there's some great reasons. And, you know, like anything, there are pros and cons. I mean, the, the cons would be you are you do have to live within the lines and, and some people may be too entrepreneurial and, and want to do something uh, totally outlandish with their brand and, and that may not fit for franchising. However, in my opinion, the benefits far outweigh the cons and the, the benefits that I would see is, you know, number one, while it doesn't entirely de-risk the proposition, it does, you are able to go in with an eyes wide open uh, perspective. Um, every franchisor has what's called an FDD or franchise disclosure document. Within that, it's an intimidating 200 page document, 23 different items or chapters. Um, two that we pay a lot of attention to, one would be your item seven and the second one would be your item 19. That item nine, item seven gets into what, what's it gonna cost? What will this investment look like? All, all things in. Uh, item 19 is how is every other franchisee in the, in the system performing? You know, what has been their ramp up? What does that look like? What is their average revenue? What is their average margin? It's not an indicator that you'll absolutely perform to that degree, but it gives you a great benchmark. So you're not just um, putting together performa on the fly. Uh, in addition, you get to do what's called validation, where you go in and you actually talk to all the other franchise owners, well, really as many as you want to, 
to understand their perspective. What kind of support have you got? And are the financials really playing out for you? And they're allowed to give you as much information as possible, which is great. Uh, so you really go in, so I'd say that's the first thing, it's going in eyes wide open. Number two, uh, you're in business on your own, but you're not by yourself. You've got a franchise or on the sidelines that has entirely aligned interest as you. They want to see you succeed. It's in their best interest for you to succeed. And so they have put together this proven model uh, that has been vetted, proven out, and they are there cheering for you, guiding you, for you, innovating with new products and new ideas along the way. Uh, you also have franchisees in other markets. They're non-competitive to you. So again, your interests are aligned. The better you perform and eventually exit your business, the better the more theirs will be worth. And so uh, there's a lot of think tanks that can happen, a lot of shared marketing ideas, a lot of shared strategies uh, that come with that. And it goes without saying, if you have a brand that has some awareness out there and you've got the built out playbook behind the operations and the marketing, you're not starting from scratch. You're not having to put this together yourself. Instead, as long as you can follow a playbook halfway decent, uh, it's just a great roadmap for you. Now, I will say any good franchisor is going to give you some leeway to allow you to test in your local market and uh, generate new ideas. You're not totally living in the silo of, uh, of uh, you know, following protocol. However, there are some guardrails in place and, and for good reason. Uh, when I was a franchisor, the franchisees I'd say that struggled the most were the ones that didn't follow the playbook, that didn't follow the system. So as long as you have that mindset going in, then your odds of success are significantly higher um, versus a traditional startup. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I know uh, starting a business from scratch requires a whole bunch of, of different areas of expertise. I mean, you've got to be good at branding and marketing and sales and operations and supply chain management and all of those things. Um, and I assume that when you go with a franchise, a lot of that is given to you. A lot of those systems are given to you. That said, I have to imagine that there is still some bar that that is set for anybody that's going to go into a franchise. Somebody that has no business experience, whatever, has no money whatsoever, uh, may, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, uh, may not be the best candidate to start a franchise or to, to buy a franchise. Um, what is that bar? So if you were going to say, hey, what is the minimum set of qualifications somebody should have before they say, now's the time for me to go buy into a franchise, what is that minimum set of qualifications that somebody should consider? Absolutely. I, I would say your work ethic goes without saying any business venture, you've got to have a work ethic. But I'd say what it really comes down to is your ability to hire great talent, retain great talent, incentivize talent. Uh, where I saw franchise owners fall down when I was on the franchisor side. And, and again, these were few and far between. By and large, franchise owners were doing very well. But the ones that did struggle were the ones that maybe came from a middle management corporate America role and they never had the uh, responsibility for hiring and firing and making those tough calls and not hanging on to someone for a little bit too long and putting up with excuses. So I'd say as long as you know how to interact with people, especially when it comes to hiring and firing and retaining and incentivizing, um, your odds of success are very high, even with no background in that industry. And that's really interesting. And, you know, I'd never thought about it that way, that corporate, uh, the franchisor, the the corporate that's, that's basically handing you the system, um, they can provide all the systems and the processes. They can provide the supply chain management and tell you how to get inventory. They can tell you how to turn inventory into product. They can tell you how to deal with sales and cash registers and, and all the accounting stuff. But the one thing they can't do is they can't hire your employees for you and they can't manage your employees for you. And so it's, it's a really good perspective that to be a great franchisee, one of the key qualifications is your ability to hire and manage great talent. So I, I guess that kind of answers my question. That's kind of the the core um, core talent that a great franchi franchisee is going to need is just that ability to hire and lead and manage and, and run a team. Is that Fair to yeah, say? Absolutely. And, you know, every franchise is different as far as what the needs are. You know, some may need someone that's more sales oriented. Some are very much a transaction oriented business. And so the skill sets that are, that are important and, and oftentimes if you have an operations background, you get nervous talking to people and you don't enjoy the sales aspect, then maybe your first hire is a great salesperson that's going to go to those BNI meetings, that's going to go to the Chamber of Commerce meetings, that's going to get out and form referral partnerships and do those things that are needed to be done. Um, and so oftentimes that first hire or first couple of hires, you're really complimenting what it is that you may not be as strong at or, or frankly enjoy doing. 
Excellent. So, John, I would love to know even more about this whole concept you mentioned earlier that often when we think of franchises, right, we just kind of automatically default to fast food, right? It's just for a long time, fast food, I would I, maybe maybe I'm incorrect, but I would say that kind of dominated franchises or what everybody's perception of a franchise was. However, you've been very clear that there are so many other types of franchises and that specifically your firm uh, specializes in those others. So I'm curious, what are some of the other leading types Types of franchises and why do they seem to be a better choice in so many instances than fast food? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's nothing wrong with food. I, I'll just be candid and say that's not my thing. And I don't have a background in food. I don't have an interest to have a background in food. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of inventory that can go bad. And, you know, it's so location dependent. I feel like there are a lot of players out there. Some will make it, some won't. Um, I'd much rather go with a, a a safer investment in a way and one that's very understandable to me. And what I found is those that I work with and those that I speak to and interact with very much are aligned with that thinking. Um, So, you know, this is the fun part for me. It's when I get to expose um, folks to here's everything that exists out there. So I like to think about franchise businesses really in four different quadrants. Uh, You've got your simple retail, you've got your complex retail, you've got your B2C services, a business to consumer, and then you've got your B2B business to business. Uh, Your simple retail, some of the characteristics there would be uh, like like the fast food concepts. You know, it's a very large labor pool, very low um, skills may be coming in. You're able to train them up in a shift or two. Obviously, you've got the build out. You've got the retail storefront location. It's very important. The, uh, the brand is very important. It's very much a transaction oriented business. You don't necessarily have to have a great sales skill set uh, to, to run this business. Uh, complex retail uh, in that second uh, quadrant would be very similar in a lot of ways, a lot of similar attributes. I'd say the differentiator there is maybe your labor force has a little more skill coming in or a license or um, you know some sort of background. So think about like a Meineke or a Mako, you know, you're hiring mechanics or even like a Massage Envy or Hand and Stone, you're hiring those that have a masseuse uh, license. Um, and so, you know, that'd be the differentiating uh, dynamic there. Uh, the B2C services, that it, that's it, typically you don't have to have a retail storefront. You may have a physical location, but that's more on the back end. It's not consumer facing. Uh, oftentimes these are van based or home based businesses where you can run remote. Uh, you know, think about uh, the property services market. That's one that, you know, we personally own, have an ownership in and, and are fond of. Uh, it's been a booming $500 billion space with all sorts of segments within it. Uh, in home senior care, uh, you know, the silver tsunami is happening. And, you know, that's another example where you're selling to consumers. Um, typically, these businesses are less expensive to get into than your brick and mortar retail businesses. You're also able to ramp up faster. So those would be a few other characteristics. Um, they are potentially a little more sales oriented. You know, it's not salesy sales. Oftentimes, it's much more consultative sales, but uh, you've got to enjoy working with people um, even more so in that one. And then B2B services. Similarly, you don't necessarily have a retail storefront. Um, but you're selling to businesses. That would be the different differentiator there. And that could be everything from cleaning and corporate maintenance to payroll and accounting uh, type firms. Now, you, you think of a business like a serve pro, that's one that would straddle and serve both consumers and businesses. So you do have some hybrids out there, um, but by and large, most businesses tend to fall into one of those four quadrants. And uh, you know what I'm seeing out there today is a lot of interest really in you know it, what would be deemed essential services or kind of those non-sexy niches that people say, hey, I, I don't have to have a flamboyant, you know, the next big brand. Instead, I'd love to work with an emerging franchise or it's got some great territory availability that has a proven profitable model and is going to support me. Um, but whether that be roll off dumpsters or whether that be a laundromat or whether that be, be a, a pool cleaning business or a roofing company, those are the ones I see a lot of people gravitating towards, uh, especially right now. Yeah, I love that. And given that much of our audience is real estate investors who are looking for either a primary or secondary stream of income um, and maybe considering franchising, uh, you touched on a number of things that would actually make a lot of sense in this business. You mentioned the ProServe type business. So so Carol and I, uh, we own a mold remediation and, 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 and water remediation business because it's a good 
It, it's adjacent to our real estate business. You mentioned roll off dumpsters and roofing companies, and I imagine HVAC companies. So there are a lot of things that I, I guess we all tend to gravitate in the franchise world to fast food, McDonald's and Subway, because those are the ones we encounter in our everyday lives, maybe 30 times a day. Um, but as real estate investors, there may be some better opportunities for us that are more aligned with our core real estate business. Um, so are there advantages to those types of service business, those B2C or B2B businesses, as opposed to the simpler complex retail um, that, that I, I mean, is there a checklist? What should we be asking ourselves when trying to decide which of those four quadrants we want to kind of lean towards? Yeah, there's so many different dynamics and factors to go into it. And I, and I do find that some people are wired and say, hey, I'd much rather have a physical location. I had a client Saturday. We're at the grand opening of uh, her location. And she said, I like having a place that I can go. Other people say, hey, I love not having to sign a five-year lease and put a personal guarantee behind it. So a lot of it comes down to the risk. Um, I, I'd say how risk averse someone is um, and really how uh, open they are to new industries. So I'd say that's another factor. I mean, a lot of people did not, this little kids say, I want to own a mold remediation company someday. But once they say, hey, wait a minute, this service isn't going anywhere, it's going to be around, you can make some money doing it. I put my business owner hat and I like what that day to day looks like. I like the types of uh, interactions that we have, the relationships with the insurance companies and such. Then, um, then that's kind of what I like to do with clients is peel back the onion and, and we really dig in deep. What do you want that day to day to look like? How much time can you commit per week? Uh, what are the things that you enjoy doing, don't enjoy doing that you want to have on your plate, off your plate? Over time, early on, you're rolling up your sleeves, you're, you're getting dirty. But um, so I'd say th there's a lot of different factors that go into uh, to that aspect. Um, but it, it's interesting you mentioned on the real estate side, it, I've got a large client right now that owns a bunch of Keller Williams brokerages. And it, in his case, he's saying, hey, I'd love to have something that complements that, thinking very much like you guys and what you did. So he's looking at some house painting franchises. He's looking at, he's actually looking at that roll off dumpster one that I mentioned. Um, but some of the other ones that he considered, you know, we're all in that, you know, like appraisers or, um, uh, you know, uh, staging uh, type franchises too. So there are a lot of different sectors out there that could be a great complement to real estate. I love that. Um, so I'm going to ask a really blunt question because I know a lot of our, our listeners are probably asking this to themselves right now. Um, we know that with a business that we start ourselves and grow ourselves, kind of the sky's the limit in terms of revenue and profit. Um, for a franchise, um, how much money can we typically expect to make? And I know that's a loaded question. The answer is all over the board, but in general. So for our listeners that are thinking, I might want to do this, but can I make a lot of money doing it? What's the answer? Absolutely. And, and I'd bucketize that into a few things. So one, you know, what is that income stream that you can generate? Is it a hundred thousand a year? You know, bottom line profit, is it 200? Is it 300? Uh, those are conversations that we oftentimes have. And, you know, what's been eye opening to a lot of people that I talk with is, Hey, you can make some really attractive margins. I think, especially for me coming from the corporate world, when I learned, Oh, the EBITDA end of the day operating margin post royalty can be between 20% and 50% that's very attractive some businesses are close to that 50 percent. i I've, i'm an investor in a driveway repair franchise and the margins on that business are hovering around 50 percent. i love it um you know a lot of businesses though fall in that 20 to 30 range which is a good paycheck if you're generating some revenue um so that would be number one number two would be uh you know and i had to remind my wife of this when i went into entrepreneurship is you know if i'm making you know 250,000 salary versus 250,000 profit uh, over here as an entrepreneur, there are a lot of expenses I can write off. There's a lot of uh, other dynamics and benefits that I get where it's not necessarily apples to apples. It, you are benefited as a small business owner. Um, and then finally, it, it's something that I remind people of oftentimes because they forget is you're building an asset. You're not just buying a job. You're not just buying an, into an income stream. You're building an asset that as long as you perform halfway decent, you should be able to exit at a value well above what you originally invested. Um, I, I've got some clients that say, hey, I only want to look at resales. And, and what I find oftentimes is there's not a lot of resales out there because people tend to hang on to these businesses. But uh, the ones that I do see are going for, you know, uh, you know, four times EBITDA, six times EBITDA, um, you know, which could be a really nice payday down the road. So uh, you're building an asset. There's an investment aspect to it, too. 
Very cool. So, John, who are you seeing with all these different aspects of of the franchise, uh, the franchise opportunities? Who are the different types of populations that you are seeing have an interest in this? Are there certain demographics that seem to be faring the best, um, certain types of people that seem to be gravitating toward this direction? And maybe even if there's any way we can talk about in terms of this past year, if maybe that has shifted with the way everybody's just overall life situation has been affected? Yeah, fantastic question. So, uh, you know, you've got your millennials, you've got Gen X, you've got the baby boomers. I'd say historically baby boomers, you know, kind of that 50 something, 60 something were a large segment. Uh, They still are, but we now see Generation X, actually roughly half of all franchise deals being done, it's Gen X. So it's kind of that late 30s to early 50s segment. Um, And then baby boomers and millennials would account for the other components there, both, uh, but, and they're all growing. You know, all, uh, all, both the seas rising, all boats are going up. Um, To get to your question about the types of uh, franchisees, so, what I see oftentimes is, especially this year, there's fears of job loss or maybe someone has lost their job. So that would be a natural right there that, hey, I don't want to go work for someone else. Maybe I've got a little too much gray in my hair to go interview again. You know, I'd like to, to be a business owner. I've always wanted to do that. But then there's a very large segment, too, that have said, hey, the stock market's up here at an all-time high. Interest rates are down here. Maybe only so many good real estate deals that I have exposure to. Where else can I invest? And they're looking for those side income streams. Oftentimes, you know, from an investment standpoint, oftentimes they can put in 10 to 15, 20 hours a week, build up over time, and then eventually make that entrepreneurial leap into the business. So see a lot of that going on. I'm personally in my early 40s. I've got a lot of clients in their 30s and 40s that are saying, hey, COVID's allowed me some time to sit back, think about the path I'm on. Maybe I do want to make a shift or as we would call it in 2020, a pivot and uh, and go a new direction. So I'd say COVID has opened up a lot of people's eyes. Our deals that are being done are up significantly year over year, especially over the past three to four months now that people are getting a little more comfortable about the vaccine and everything else going on. Um, so there's there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of people buying into that interest. That's great. I, I want to set expectations because I know a lot of people that I talk to talk about starting a business or buying a business. We talk a lot about buying businesses on the show, which is uh, somewhat similar to buying into a franchise and, and is probably a little bit further removed from starting your own business. Um, One of the big questions we always get is, what are the opportunities for passive business ownership? So if I buy into a franchise, should I expect that I'm going to be working 50, 100, 120 hours a week uh, for the first year or five or 10? Um, Or is there some way to cut that down? Can I still make decent margins and a decent profit if I want to run a business, uh, a franchise passively? And I guess leading into that, my next question, but I'll ask now because maybe it it factors in, um, but scaling. Um, should I be thinking about buying two or five or 10 franchises uh, the day I buy that first one? And does that factor into my ability to, to scale and, and operate passively? Yeah, excellent question. So I'll start out by saying, if you're buying a franchise, it's not passive. There is no true passive opportunity unless you have your son-in-law you know, that's going to run the business, that's signing the agreement with you. I mean, now there's some that if you have that strong GM in place from day one, it could be almost passive, but still it's not entirely passive. Um, and so that is a misnomer that I think some people have out there. And so I always want to clarify that it takes work. It, it is a semi-absentee opportunity, which does exist with a lot of businesses. Um, it, it really is how comfortable are you with bringing someone on staff to run that business for you? And at what juncture? Is it pre-profitability? Is it you know three months in, six months in? So that's an individual situation. But um, you know, as far as the multiples go, uh, it is very common in franchising to buy a what we would call a three pack or a five pack or a seven pack. And so you go in, you're buying a defined territory and you may open up, open up that first location or that first territory, you know, day one. And then six months down the road, you open up number two, 12 months from now, you open up number three. And so you have a development schedule planned out that makes sense. Um, so you're not doing it all on day one, but it allows it allows you to really take over a large chunk of the market and have protected territories. Um, you know, from an upfront standpoint, you do get a deal. Typically that second territory and third territory is a little less uh, if you were to buy them up front. So uh, very, very common to go with that path. Um, and that's a question I talk with clients about all the time is, you know, would you rather go deep with this one brand in this one sector or 
do you like the idea of maybe buying into another business that could either complement it or diversify from it? Um, and so that's a strategy too. I mean, that's what my partners and I've done here in Atlanta, where we own three different home services businesses, all very complementary pool cleaning company, home cleaning company, and carpet cleaning company, we're able to get a lot of referrals and cross selling on the front end. On the back end, we get economies of scale with the shared services. So it really comes down to the individual and what they're looking for and what they want their involvement to be. Excellent. So I would love to know, John, there are so many opportunities and I especially love what you just said about the opportunities to buy into kind of adjacent different franchises where you get referrals from each other, where you can share your workforces, all of those shared things to to grow even more successfully. I'm curious, though, how do I go about getting the money to do all of these different franchises. I mean, that seems like a lot of financing would have to be available in some way, shape or form. Can you talk us more through how that works? Well, the costs are just details, right, Carol? Oh. Um, no, that, that's a great question. And, and that does prohibit some people from buying in. So uh, several paths are very common within franchising. One, and I'll say a trend I'm seeing right now is a lot of self-funded deals. Um, again, a lot of people have capital on sidelines and they're, it doesn't have a great home. It's terrible problem to have, I know, but they're looking to self-fund the deals. So I'm seeing that is a big trend, but uh, SBA loans have historically been a very large component of funding. Um, right now, I will say the SBA process is pretty cumbersome and taking a while and not a lot of fun. So people oftentimes are shying away from that if they can, um, but that is definitely still an avenue. Um, uh, another one that is very, very popular is the 401k or IRA rollover. So we call them a Rob's plan. Um, Benetrends runs them, Guidant Financial, Fran Fund, uh, Tenant Financial, a lot of large institutions run this program that allows you uh, to, to receive tax benefits by not being penalized and rolling over your 401k or IRA to fund, uh, to fund the business. So, um, you know, that's one that we, and there's a few steps you have to go through setting up a C Corp and handling things a little bit different, but it allows you to avoid that tax penalty to use your retirement funding, which for a lot of people though, you know, with the rise in the stock market is a great avenue right now. And, and the cool thing about those Rob's plans are a lot of people think when they're doing stuff out of their uh, 401k or IRA, they think, okay, all that money has to roll back in and I can't touch it till I'm 65. Uh, with those Rob's plans that you talked about, you're actually required to take a distribution and, and a part of your salary or, or a salary every year. So it's a way to basically use your 401k or your IRA um, to to pay yourself money every year to generate income that you can actually live on doesn't necessarily just need to be rolled back into your IRA the way most plans Great are. Point. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so I know that you do some other types of matchmaking in the franchise world, and it, it's it's around the fran it's around I'm sorry it's around the financing area. So I, I know there's another way that that people who are looking to uh, to get into a franchise, buy into a franchise, can potentially uh, get the money for it. Can you talk a little bit about the other side of things and 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 what you do there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like I said, Frambridge Consulting is is our core business. Uh, you know, the, the consulting side um, where we play matchmaker on the business to the entrepreneur. On the capital side, we have Frambridge Capital, and, and I have to say we're early into this. We've done a few deals now, but I don't want to uh, position it that it's something that it's not. Um, we ourselves have brought in some outside investors to participate in the franchises that we uh, are franchisees of, um, and, and then I've had the opportunity now to to bring in several investors that are looking for a true passive opportunity. Maybe they want to sit on that quarterly board call or they want to have that annual shareholder meeting, um, you know, but and maybe provide a little advice from the sideline, but they really don't want to be involved in the business. Um, but they love the idea of diversifying, you know, seeing franchising as an asset class, if you will. So looking to diversify some of that capital on the sidelines, put it behind oftentimes some, some younger folks, um, you know, that, that may be in a position, oftentimes it could be military veterans that, uh, you know, have a, all the skill sets, great background, but they don't have the capital on the sidelines to, to deploy. Um, and so they come behind them. And so I see a huge opportunity there. I will say we're in the earlier stages, uh, still testing a few different uh, ways of going about it, but I do see um, more of that happening on the private side. I've got to call it eight o'clock tomorrow morning with some clients in Charlotte, North Carolina, where, um, you know, it's a group of four, two are very uh, senior in their careers. They've got a lot of money to invest. And then we've got two young guns that they're looking to put the money behind. Um, so it is neat when you're able to 
uh, you know, pull that together on your own, but that's something that we're looking to help facilitate as well uh, going forward. Wow, there are so many amazing facets to this. And every time you answer a question, you keep dropping all these awesome new just knowledge bombs. I love it. And I think so many things are so massively eye-opening to our listeners. Like just something you mentioned there about the group of four in Charlotte, North Carolina, right? I mean, what a great opportunity when you've got people at different points in their careers who may have different skill sets and just seeing what they're able to do together through franchising. I think there are so many great great avenues. Um, that said, there are so many different things to say, to take into consideration, like you mentioned before. The type of franchise, the adjacent franchises, the financing, working with other people. It's, it's frankly a little bit overwhelming, right? There are so many things to take into consideration. So I'm curious, John, for our audience members, do you have just kind of a recommended step-by-step, almost playbook on if one of us were interested in perhaps going the franchise route where we would even begin? Yeah, no, a- absolutely. And in the spirit of franchising, we do have a playbook around this process as well. So uh, we, we've tried to streamline a process to um, make it as efficient and um, ineffective as possible. And it's really been proven out over time. And, and what that looks like, you know, you know, and there are others out there certainly that do what we do, but, you know, the way that we go about it is, you know, we, we have an intro call, get to know the individual, help them understand his franchising viable for them? You know, would they be a good fit uh, for a franchise system? Do we see the success based on their background, based on um, you know, kind of who they are and what they're looking to do? Um, and so we're able to kind of, you know, help them understand that very quickly. And then from there, uh, you know, I have them fill out a, a, a form. It takes about 10 minutes, but it's things you like, things you don't like, what is your financial position? It's confidential, but it gives me a good uh, snapshot of where they are. Um, from that, we then spend about 45 minutes to an hour on a call, a consultation call, I shed light on a lot of things that we're seeing out in franchising today, but really the whole goal of that call is to get to know them. So I'm asking them a lot of questions. So I'm asking them about, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to risk tolerance. You know, are you okay with larger franchisors or smaller ones? Here are the pros and cons of each. There's just a lot of different dynamics that we get into. Um, from there, I kind of put together a profile of where I see uh, the opportunities uh, fitting for them. I then go out to the franchisors, work to see what territory availability we have for their targeted area. Um, and typically, I'll start out, you know, I've got 15 in mind, and then I narrow it down based on territory availability and, and such, and pick the best four, five, six opportunities for them to consider. So it's taken this universe of 4,000 franchise brands down to our 300 vetted ones, down to really a curated uh, assortment of four to six on average uh, that I take them through. We spend about an hour on a video call. We look at the websites. I share with them, um, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes? You know, what, are they doing a lot of deals? Here's what the leadership team looks like. Here's what your day-to-day would look like. Here's the item seven where, you know, what is your all-in cost? You know, what are the startup costs and such? And, and we get into the detail on that with the goal of narrowing it down to two, maybe three at most, to then simply have an introduction call with, with the franchisors. I introduce them, uh, they have that call. They're not obligated to a second call, but it allows them to hear about the opportunity from the franchisor's perspective, who really is the expert. And then, uh, you know, if they feel that's a good match and the franchisor feels it could be a good match, then they'll then have a series of calls, um, you know, in which they review the FDD, the, the disclosure document, in which they uh, look at territory availability, in which they go through their brand presentations, ultimately culminating in what's called a discovery day um, and, and they're talking to other franchisees along the way, you know, understanding it from a validation standpoint, but culminating in discovery day that uh, they, they then get to meet all franchisors team members and such, and ultimately deciding if they want to, uh, to sign an agreement or not. Um, and, and I help them along the way, you know, help them with the legal review and the funding side and, and, and uh, just kind of serve as a sounding board. So it's a process I love going through and we found it to be the most effective one um, you know, for someone that's coming in uh, with an interest. That sounds fantastic, right? And you clearly have it streamlined so that, you know, someone like me isn't just running around all over the place trying to trying to evaluate all the different components. You have all the aspects and facets worked out into this great streamlined system. Um, one of the things that you've mentioned several times during that process, as well as other parts of, of our questioning, um, we you've talked a bunch about territory availability. I'm curious, like, um, again, a lot of our uh, audience members are real estate investors. And we talk a good bit about sometimes um, the the advantages of being physically 
in that space where you're investing, but the opportunities that are sometimes available in a remote location where you're not physically present. Would you be able to talk to us a little bit more, John, about how that applies to franchising? Is it super important that we are physically located in those territories that are available? And slash or are there still opportunities or, you know, pros and cons about doing uh, a franchise that only has territory availability somewhere you're not necessarily located? All the above. So uh, I'll give two examples there. One uh, client of mine, Nathan Bocock in Columbia, South Carolina. He's the largest owner of two men uh, in a truck, the moving franchise. He operates in about 10, 11 markets young guy, late thirties, it's done very well. Um, but he's got essentially, I call him his lieutenants in each of these markets. And we've actually done two deals this past year together on other brands that he's brought into his portfolio. They're in remote markets and he's got his lieutenants running these, you know, he's given them some equity and letting them run them and he trusts them. He's kind of raised them up. Um, but then I've got another client here in Atlanta that, uh, you know, fell in love with the concept I showed him. It's called Smash My Trash. It's a big old truck with a crane arm on the back and it goes up to roll off dumpsters and smashes down the waist to about one third of the original size. And so you save two out of three trips to the landfill. Anyway, I can talk about that business all day. It's a really, really cool one. Anyway, Atlanta was sold out. He was a 42 year old wealth manager, uh, wealth advisor here in Atlanta. And uh, he actually made the decision Let's move the family down to Fairhope, Alabama, Mobile, Pensacola, that whole Gulf area down there uh, where he saw some very viable opportunity. And uh, But he was up against a few others that wanted that same territory even down there. So ultimately, it came down to the franchise where we're saying, hey, we think you can do the best job of farming our land, if you will, um, you know, in, in that territory. And uh, so it, it really, it comes down to the individual, to their situation, whether they're open to moving, uh, oftentimes, Oftentimes they're not. Um, you know, I'd say that's more of a rare case. But um, you know, if you have good people, again, that's what it comes down to. If you're able to hire good people and you trust them and you get incentivize them correctly, whether it be through equity or profit sharing, um, then it, it's absolutely a possibility to operate in a remote market. I, I love that. And we often, I mean, people might laugh when you think, oh, I'm going to move just to start a franchise when there's a million possibilities for franchising, uh, no matter where you are. But I mean, Carol and I in the real estate space are constantly telling people that uh, if, if you want to get into real estate, sometimes where you are isn't the best place to be for what you want to do. And you have to ask yourself the question, is it more important that I'm, that I'm where I am? Or is it more important that I'm able to do what I want to do? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. And for some people in some situations, moving is a perfectly viable choice because it's more important that you get to do what you want to do, not necessarily where you are. For other people, being where you are is more important, and then you just have to change what you're going to do. So um, I, I think that answer probably resonates with a lot of people that are listening to the show because it's the same advice that we give to our real estate investors. Make that decision. Do you want to be where you are? Do you want to do what you want to do? Um, and then kind of go from there. Um, okay, so let's think a little bit further down the road. Let's say I buy a franchise um, or I buy into a franchise. Let's say I open two or three or five different franchises, either the, the same brand or different adjacent brands. Um, and let's say I do this for five or 10 or 20 or 25 years. Um, and at some point I'm going to want to do something different or I'm going to want to retire or I'm going to want to move. Um, what do exit strategies look like in the franchise world? What do typical people who have been in a franchise for some period of time and decide now is the time for me to kind of move on? What are the options for those people? Yeah, absolutely. And again, if you run it halfway decent, you should be able to sell that business assuming it's still a viable business. And you know, depending on the type of business really dictates the, uh, it's not just the ref revenue and the margins, but you know, what type of business is it? Is it capital intensive? Is there a lot of equipment that comes with the business? Is there any, any sort of intellectual property that would keep competition out of that territory? Um, you know, is it a business that, uh, you know, it's gonna, if it's retail, is it gonna re require a remodel or, uh, you know, or revamping of the team? So all those factors play in, but um, you know, whether you work through a business broker or biz buy sell or, um, you know, you're advertising your local community, letting it be known. Um, you know, the, and, and the franchisor will help you oftentimes as well. And ultimately, I'd say the difference between selling a regular business and selling a franchise, the franchisor does have to approve that buyer. Um, usually that's not an issue, um, but of course it could be if you're selling it to the, 
some crazy that's going to take their brand and destroy it. But um, so I'd say it's very typical to, to with the one difference being you get the, that leverage of the franchise brand where they get the exposure out there. They may have a lot of candidates that have shown interest in that territory over the years, but it was sold to you. And now you're able to go back and kind of have an immediate lead list uh, to target. Excellent. Excellent. So take us into 2021, right? What are you feeling strongly about? What are the trends you're seeing? Where does the most opportunity lie? What are the sectors that are going to be doing, in your opinion, the best in the world of franchising moving forward? Yeah, since we all know exactly how 2021 is going to play out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry not to be a forecaster, but I, I will say some of the macro trends um, you know, that we just have to be cognizant of. One, you've got this aging population and uh, you know the silver tsunami, 10,000 people turning 65 every day. That's not going anywhere. Uh, so what are those services that cater to them? Not just the in-home care, but also you know, there are certain fitness concepts that cater to them. There are certain medical uh, related concepts. Uh, there are certain, you know, whether it be wheelchair ramps and stair lifts and chair lifts businesses. Um, and so, you know, I'd say that's a category that's got to continue doing well. I do think property services and home services will continue booming. It was doing well prior to COVID. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, it's deemed an essential service, um, you know, the different aspects there. And uh, so lots of interest there. So I, I see that continuing to do well. Health and wellness is definitely a space. I, I mentioned that grand opening Saturday. It was for an IV drip um, business, all about, and they're able to administer kind of a concoction at the IV level, a cellular level that fights free radicals, that boosts your immunity, that fight, you know, reduces heavy metals in your blood. The, the focus on health and wellness is only growing exponentially. So, what are those concepts? They have a unique. They can go into that niche and, uh, and really exploit it. Um, so, I'd say that's another one. You know, I personally still like a lot of businesses. I mentioned it once or twice now, the roll-off dumpsters. I mean, those kind of businesses um, that are non-sexy, that, that are attracting people, um, you know, right and left. Um, so th those are a few, to, you know, I, I think fitness will start coming back. You know, everyone wanted to be the next Orange Theory. Boutique fitness was growing exponentially, you know, in 2019, uh, he heading into the first part of 2020. Obviously, they faced some road bumps, created a lot of concern uh, around who will be the strong ones, the ones that survive. Um, so I think there will be some shifting around there. Definitely see that as an opportunity, maybe in the latter part of 2021. Um, you know, again, I, I, I know within food, there's going to be opportunities. That's just a space that, I have chosen not to focus on uh, so that I can focus on these other ones. Do you see any, um, uh, do you ever think about, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to, to phrase this, um, economic cycles. So clearly there are times where the economy is going to be a little bit more favorable to certain types of businesses than others. And there are going to be other times where the economy is yeah. favorable to other types of businesses. Um, do you ever think about where the economy is headed and kind of recommend that people uh, focus on certain types of franchises? Or is it more of a franchise is a long term play and the economic cycles are ultimately going to come and go? And, and so you just you just play through it. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think of, you know, discretionary spending. So even within that property services space, you know, plumbing, you're not going to not unclog your drains, you know, in a downturn, um, but you may choose not to do the home remodel. So, I, you know, that'd be an example there. Um, I, I feel that, you know, and that's why I like the senior space, because that's one that isn't going anywhere, that people have to have that, um, you know, so yeah, that, that definitely comes into play. Um, you know, what is discretionary, what is not discretionary, um, you know, as, as far as how people think about things, where are those macro trends, um, you know, from a, and this is interesting on the resale side, from a large standpoint, your baby boomers, you know, aging, uh, coming up age, a lot of them are business owners today. A lot of them will be selling their businesses. Uh, we've been really in a seller's market since 2015. I mean, the multiples that we've been getting and typically it fluctuates every five to seven years. But since 2015, you've seen small businesses in the seller's market. Um, we anticipate uh, in the first half of next year, start seeing that change as boomers are exiting their businesses. There's going to be more supply than demand. Prices will come down. So I think there's going to be a lot of resale opportunities for buyers um, coming in as well. Okay, so then that leads me into my next question. I, I really appreciate this because I hadn't even thought about that until you just said what you said. Um, but 
as somebody who might want to buy into a franchise, um, is there a difference for me? Should I be focusing on whether I buy a new franchise in a new territory directly from the franchisor versus buying out somebody who's exiting the business, maybe because they're going to retire or they're having health issues or they're going to move or maybe the operator passed away? Um, as somebody that's thinking about buying a franchise, what what should I be thinking about in terms of whether I go a brand new store route versus versus buying somebody out? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the benefits of uh, buying into a resale, as I'm terming it, uh, in operating business is, you know, you can probably hit the ground running faster, get to profitability faster. Um, you know, they, there's an awareness of that brand, that, of that business in the local market. Um, the downside would be you probably are paying a little bit more uh, than you would from a greenfield you know, startup standpoint. Um, you, you may have legacy team members that you don't necessarily want, wouldn't rehire, you know, if it was up to you. Um, so you're maybe not able to put your thumbprints all over it quite as much. So, you know, there are pros and cons both ways. I do have some clients, I, I'd say it's a minority of clients, but I do have some that uh, say, hey, I only want to look at existing businesses. Um, but but I do think that dynamic could change. I mean, as part of the economic cycle, as part of the uh, the coming of age of the baby boomers, I think there will be a lot of opportunity for more existing businesses. Um, and I think oftentimes those may be more strategic purchases too, where they're able to bolt it onto an existing business. Um, you know, so it may be more maybe more complementary um, as well. That's awesome. I and and. Uh, honestly, I'd never even thought about that. I guess when I think about uh, somebody starting a franchise, you always typically think about you go to the franchise or you talk about a new territory and you do a build out and you hire your own team. But I guess for some people having that that even more of a uh, business in a box um, where you can literally come into a hired team and in a, a running store and on day one, um, you're generating income as opposed to basically starting up on your own. That's an option for those that 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 may see that as an advantage. And I was going to mention you were asking about exit strategies earlier. That's another one that comes into play oftentimes. Is you know here in Atlanta that driveway business. There's four franchise owners in Atlanta. Well, at some point, someone's going to say, "Hey, I really love this business. I'm kind of doing better than the rest," and they're going to approach the others about buying their business. So when you do have multiple owners in a market, there's that potential for um, the merging, and uh, you know that's a natural natural exit right there. Uh, so let me ask you one more follow-up question on that. So do we typically, or do you typically see um, or ever see distressed uh, franchise ease that are looking to sell because they're just, they're tired, the businesses aren't doing well, selling at a discount and somebody that's really entrepreneurial or more entrepreneurial than, than, than maybe a typical franchisee who says, I can come in, I can turn that store around, buy it cheap and then have an opportunity um, if they're really smart and really good to turn it around. Um, or are those the types of stores that the franchisor will kind of take over and say, okay, let's start from scratch? Yeah, in most cases, the franchisor would rather not take it back because that's something they have to then reflect on their FDD that they, um, you know, essentially had a closure, if you will. Uh, now there are different ways to categorize that that we have to look at, but um, ultimately they would love to find another owner. So if it's a viable owner that's approaching them, they'll oftentimes help facilitate that sale. I just did a deal um, here in the southeast with a client of mine that was a resale of a distressed uh, fitness location. Uh, it was a kickboxing type studio. And uh, they were able to get it for probably a quarter on the dollar um, for the equipment and what went into it originally. Um, you know, they're pretty much starting at ground zero, but they had the build out and they had the equipment. So, um, you know, I, I probably painted a little bit too rosy of a picture here today because I get really excited. And by and large, you see successful franchise owners out there. Uh, but there are definitely those cases where ultimately it comes down to the individual and, again, their ability to hire and retain talent um, and manage that aspect that if they don't have that, then those are the ones that, you know, may fail and I uh, have to look for a you know, distress sale, if you, if you will. Awesome. Well, this has been tremendously enlightening, um, but we are getting to that point in the show, the final segment that we call the four more. And that's where we're going to ask you the same four questions that we ask all of our guests. And then the more part of the four more, we're going to let you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and your business and your services. Sound good? Perfect. Sounds great. Okay. Then I will take the first question. Uh, John, what was your very first or your very worst job and what lessons did you take from it that you're still using today? Yeah, very first, you know, very first job would be bagging groceries at the local grocery store and mowing grass. But I'd say my first real job uh, was in consulting uh, with a large consulting firm coming out of college. And um, ultimately, uh, 
got into a role that was very IT related and coding and I did not like it at all, but I learned very quickly how to play to my strengths and serve more on the project management side, work with IT individuals. And so I kind of helped position it into um, and, and designed a role for myself that was needed, that made sense. And uh, the biggest lesson for me coming out of that was, hey, stick with it, grind it, don't quit, uh, find a way to make it work, knowing that it's not a forever thing. Love that. Thank you. Okay, here's my second question. What is the best piece of advice you have, John, for small business owners or entrepreneurs or potential franchisees that you haven't yet mentioned today? Absolutely. I, I think it's easy, especially as a business owner, to become very introspective and um, uh, you know very focused on, on yourself and uh, what you're doing. I think realizing it's not just about us, but there's a bigger world out there and, and looking for ways to get back. And I think businesses that do good do well. Um, you know, I always I try to subscribe to the theory, uh, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, you know, it's a verse from the Bible, and that's how I try to live my life. And I think that if you can be a good steward of the opportunity, the opportunity as a business owner, the opportunity, the profits you're making, uh, the influence you have there in the community, then um, then it, it'll be good in a lot of ways, but it'll be good for business as well. Businesses that do good do well. I absolutely love that. Um, okay. Question number three, and uh, this is where I typically ask, and I'm going to ask, uh, what your favorite book out there is for business owners or prospective aspiring business owners um, that maybe not everybody has heard about. Uh, but I'm also going to give you an opportunity because I know you have a book coming out in the next couple months. So I'll give you an opportunity if you want to talk a little bit about what that's going to be about. And then I still want to hear your best book recommendation uh, for somebody that's looking to pick up a book today. Yeah, really excited about the launch of my book in Q1. So, you know, I've learned a lot in the process here writing the book. And, and um, you know, I created a fictional tale that it teaches a lot of franchise principles. So think of uh, like Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team, kind of a similar way. Uh, so I've got three young guys that uh, uh, are interested in uh, business ownership. One decides to go with the traditional tech startup. One gets cold feet and uh, stays in the corporate world. And the one that uh, goes down the franchise path. And so it picks up uh, their story every five years along the way and how that plays out and with their families. And, um, it, and so really excited about getting that out the door. It's, it's, it's done. It just has to uh, literally get out the door the last couple of steps. Awesome. Do you have a title for it yet? The Franchise Path. The franchise path. Awesome. We'll be on the lookout for it. Now, I am going to come back to the, the question that I normally ask, though. Um, if you had to recommend a great business book out there that, that we should all be reading, what's your, what's your favorite? What's your recommendation? Yeah, I, you know, I've reread this one multiple times. It's Darren Hardy's The Compound Effect. And it's a whole idea, you know, Atomic Habits is, is very similar in some regards, but it's doing the little things on a daily basis that really have that cumulative value over time. So, uh, you know, small deposits add up to big things. And, um, you know, it's just a great reminder to me, you know, whether I'm parenting my kids, whether I'm in, uh, you know, doing the little things in the business that I know over time will matter, even if you don't see the results on a daily basis. Um, so that would be my favorite book. Love it. And it sounds like that's such a great one in so many different aspects of life. So that's fantastic. Okay. Our fourth and my favorite fun question for you, John, is what is something along the way? So either in your work life or your home life that you have splurged on that was totally and entirely worth it? You know, I, I joined the Entrepreneurs Organization about three years ago, EO, and that has just been a great ride. And I wouldn't say that was the splurge, that was an investment. Um, but we take two retreats every year, and one of them is international. So I've got seven other business owners in my forum. We get together monthly, and uh, every February, March timeframe, uh, we'll, we'll take a big trip international. So last year we went to Costa Rica, got it in right before COVID. You know, we're surfing and um, doing all sorts of scuba diving and such. And before that was Bon Air. Um, this year we're headed out to Colorado. So we're keeping it domestic, but we're going to do some, uh, take a pretty extensive expedition with some world-class skiers uh, there in the, the backwoods of Colorado. So really excited. Every trip that we splurge on like that just pays dividends and spades and uh, you come back with ideas you come back encouraged and, and really motivated to get after that next year that's awesome love that john okay so that was the four part of the four more now for the more part of the four more can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you where they can find out more about frambridge consulting frambridge capital uh, how they can connect with you or anything else you want to let them know 
Absolutely. So would love to speak with any of you that are interested in learning more about franchising, um, you know, the different opportunities out there and what that looks like. Uh, but our, we've got the website, Frambridge Consulting, uh, where you can get some more information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly, John, J-O-N, no H, J-O-N, at FranbridgeConsulting.com. And I uh, would love to set up a brief intro call and have a discussion and, and get to know you. Um, as well as feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out once or twice a month. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, you know, I, I love talking about this topic and would love to help in any way. John, this has been amazing. I know a lot of our listeners out there, um, I've gotten questions about franchising all the time, and this was tremendously informative. Uh, you basically walked us through the process, and, and so I hope anybody that's interested in uh, considering franchising, they reach out to you and, uh, and, and they get more information. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your, your expertise and your knowledge and your experience, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Carol. Right. Thanks so much. Oh my goodness. I know I always say, oh my goodness, but truly how awesome was John in presenting franchising in such a clear way. I especially loved how he really laid out a clear blueprint on how to begin kind of cutting through all the overwhelm that can go along with exploring franchises. And I love that he showed there are all these opportunities for us as real estate investors, right, to look at franchise opportunities that are adjacent to our existing businesses and adjacent to one another to do cross marketing, cross promotions, shared workforces and so on. So just so much outstanding information all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. And I especially loved uh, the quote he gave us towards the end of the show, businesses that do good, do well. And it, it factors right back into what we were saying in the intro here. Um, it's important for us to be doing good, not just personally, but in our businesses every day, because it does come back to us. So anyway, for anybody out there that is looking to, con or is considering jumping into the franchise world, I hope you'll consider giving John a call, maybe checking out the book that he's releasing next quarter. Uh, but that was just a tremendously informative episode. But that said, I think we're almost done here. Are we done here? I need to go eat some cookies. Let's rock and roll, baby. Uh, it's Christmas week. I need to go <laughs> eat some cookies. Let's do it. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Have an amazing holiday, whichever holiday or any holiday that you celebrate. Have a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. And we will talk to you again next week here on the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. She's Carol. I'm Jay. Now get out there and do even more good today. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, everybody.